we called it Big Twin Lake, but Nuevo County has a different name for it. Well, Marvin Dave's mom and dad owned the piece just in front of the lake. If you was to go down 40th Street, maybe a mile from the North Star Cafe, which I have no idea what it's called nowadays, the property would have been on the right, and then Basswood would have been in between um, M37 in their property. And if you went down Basswood and took the first two tracks to the left, that goes to Twin Lake. If you went down past the curve, you go over the railroad tracks, then there's a log cabin on the left you can see in the early spring and fall. Mm-hmm. And that was the cabin where Marv lived at, to the lake. So for the listener, the Marv we're talking about is Marvin. Yeah, Marvin Gabriel. Okay, and he right now sits on death row. So Marv is totally crazy. He was crazy back in the day. Marv smoked a lot of crack. Well, back then, Free Basin, it was a little bit different than crack. I had heard about Marv. Somebody called me in Florida and told me about it. And it was actually on our local news down there. So I turned the channel on and uh, and seen Marv on there. And then we moved back a few years after that. And I was fishing in that lake because that lake's a good lake to fish. You know? And I was with my daughter, and I actually snagged. His body. What? Up from the bottom with uh, with a uh, spoon. <clears throat> I had a warrant from my arrest for a few things. So I couldn't really turn it in, but it got turned in. And um, So you literally found a body, but you didn't want to be the one to turn it in, so someone else did it. Yep. Ugh, oh, that's awful. And you knew when you found that body th- that Marvin had done it? Yeah, I knew who it was when I pulled up the sweater. And how, how when did, when was it that he did this? How, how, like, how long had the person been in the lake? That was 1992 or three, or maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later. When did you get pregnant? April 91. So it was around 91, 92 when. He was put in the lake, and then when I was there, it was around 2001 or two. Was the one or two? So that was around the time when that when that when that happened, I believe. Now I've had some pretty traumatic things happen in the last couple of decades, so my memory could actually be off on the years. He was a little bit older and a little frail. So it was a it was a weak guy. Actually, all of them I could think of that Mark killed were kind of weak. After we spoke, I spent some time wrapping my head around what I had just heard. Could he really have found Wayne Davis's body first? His reason for not reporting it made sense, but I couldn't figure out how the body was found after he'd spotted it. He gave me a description of exactly where it was found. Twinwood Lake back east corner close to a pile of logs set in place for fishing. But how did you arrange for his body to be found by someone else after you left? I asked him. He private messaged me back. I didn't. Fate stepped in. That lake is used a lot. I just dislodged the body. Someone else called it in the next day. That lake has trout, bass, bluegill, speckled bass, bullhead. It's fished a lot. Wayne Davis had been in that lake for five years, so him dislodging the body made sense, but then I was thinking, wait a minute. Davis went missing in February. This is Michigan. That lake would have been frozen in February. How would Marvin Gabrion have even gotten Wayne into a frozen lake in the first place? So I messaged my source back, and he replied, he was near the mouth of a flowing stream that doesn't freeze over in winter. Now, for the listener, I want you to know that Twinwood Lake is a different lake than Oxford Lake, the one where Rachel Timmerman was found. They're about 25 or so miles apart. Both lakes had campgrounds and boat launches at the time, which made them convenient for someone with a propensity for getting rid of his victims in bodies of water where he knew they would be harder to find. But the thing of particular interest about Twinwood Lake is that Marvin Gabrion had lived in a cabin on that lake so it was familiar terrain for him. 
Wayne's body was found within walking distance from that cabin in winter when all you had to do was walk across the lake on foot. Or maybe you had an ice fishing shanty out there with a large enough hole to fit a pair of shoulders through. Did you take a look at the pictures I sent you? Yeah, I know exactly where it was. Okay, where was it in that picture of the Twinwood Lake? It's right there where the creek comes in. So on the bottom, uh, was it correct, the southeast portion near the bottom, is that area where you were fishing? Yeah, as you see, a drop-off point. There used yeah. to be a, a snag of trees that the DNR put there for fish, and it was in that snag. So the area that I close up on was the correct area? Yeah, it was a little bit off the picture, but yeah, it was in the, in the same area. And now, how did you access that area? Is it dry? How close can you drive before you have to get out and walk it? You can get up to the lake on the uh, north side there, where they, you see the rail, the road. You see the main road or the main dirt road, and then you come, come off of that to a two track, and you take that two track back about a quarter mile. Then there's like a little campground type thing. And the boat launch, and that's where that's where we were parked. You were parked like uh, how far from where you were was the campground part? I thought the campground was up north, on the north section. Oh, well, there's little areas there people party and park where they used to be. Okay. I don't know if there still is. The DNR might have cracked down on all that stuff. All right. Yeah, I wanted to get an idea just because I think I am going to take a trip, take someone with me, and go down and uh, just take a look at it. Yeah, yeah if, you get, if you want to go to that area, you're going to need a rowboat. All right, good. Let, I'm glad you told me. So you can't get to the area where you were without a boat? You can when it's frozen. That <laughs> all made sense to me then. So you've been there when it's iced over, and did you ice fish on that lake? Um, Once, maybe a long time ago, but we've been back there. The locals, you know, we go everywhere when we're teenagers. Yeah. You know, we always investigate yeah. stuff. At least we did back in the 80s and 70s. And... Yeah. Do you know if Marvin was prone to ice fishing on that lake, Twinwood? I've never seen Marvin fish, but that don't mean he didn't do it. Is he just wasn't one of my somebody I'd go fishing with? Okay. Let's first talk about the the day that you were at the lake. He was found, Wayne Davis, in 2002. Okay. So. You were in that back east corner, and you said where you were was it was how near was it to the where the stream comes in the um, creek part? It was pretty. It was pretty close. It was just you, you look over my left hand on my left side and you see the stream coming in. Okay, that's why I was there. I was I was kind of going for trout. That'd be the area where I'd come in, feed, and maybe go back in the creek. So we were, I was trout fishing. I had my daughter pan fishing. Um, little gill or whatever. And uh, so I was fishing off the bottom, and that's how I got hooked into the sweater. Okay, sweater. now... It might have been like a flannel shirt or sweater. So you guys were fishing from a boat or from the side on that yeah. wood stuff? Boat. Uh, from a boat. And how far from the from the side were you? We were right there. If you look at the tropical, we were right there at the drop-off point. So that area where where it drops out from the creek into the lake is a big, a deep drop-off point. No, I don't think that lake's very deep anywhere. Uh, it, but it's over your head, you know. Okay. All right. So you were fishing there and you snagged it. Tell me how far, if you recall, that the you pulled it out of the water. Oh, I pulled it back out of the water. I got got it up and grabbed the the shirt and so I grabbed... cut my line and left. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that would be okay. The day's over, Leslie. All right. So where on the on the body that you found did you grab it? Just on the back of the sweater or, or the shirt. I, for some reason, my brain's sticking with a like a dark like a red or burgundy or something. I don't know okay. if that's what it was. You know, like I said, your mind just played tricks on you. Yeah, and it's been a long time. Um, and then, so did you see the head portion? No, I did not. It was just the back and the shoulders. Okay. And, and so was there anything else you noticed about it before you dropped it back down? It didn't go back down. It floated? Yeah, it, it stayed at the top of the surface there. 
It did not go bad. That's why the people found them so quick. Okay. And so it was what you think that the that you grabbed onto was a sweater or a shirt in like a darkish color. Yeah. Okay. And, and it wasn't it, it wasn't twenty four hours later and I seen Bobby's picture on I think Fox seventeen or one of them. Okay, so that would be the next day. Oh yeah. It was when I got off work the next day and came anyway, when I got home and it was his picture mugshot was on there and I realized it was twin lake, twin was lake. Big twins what we called it, but I knew what it was. When you when you pulled the body out, did you know who it was? No, I had an idea because the time frame if I remember right was when Marv was out there. But them guys had the house. If you when you turn into Basswood Lane, I think is what they call that road, or maybe Basswood Road. Mm-hmm. When you turn in there, if you're coming from Hardy Dam, you'll see uh, what might be like a double wide or a trailer or an old house to the left just before you turn in, and that was Marv's mom and dad. What about the cabin that you said he he stayed in? He rented he rented that. It's a red well, it used to be a red log cabin. So it's on top of the the hill would be on the west side of the lake. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like a little bold house or something down there, and there's stairs going down to it. So it was on the lake? Yes. Well, it's not right on the lake, because on that side of the lake, there's a hill, so it's on top of that hill. Okay. If you uh, to get to that cabin, you got to pass the access to the lake, which there are signs that says access to whatever lake to the left. You go past that lake. No, there used to be a railroad tracks there that keep taking all the tracks out, so I don't know if they're still going to be there. Mm-hmm. You go around the corner, you go over the railroad tracks, you go back to the left again, and you start looking to the left, and you'll see the cabin. Okay. You said you thought that because of the time frame that it was someone that he had killed, but he had killed a couple people that they still hadn't found that they assumed. Remember, there was that John Weeks guy, um, and then there was the transient guy, Robert Allen. And then there was Wayne. You said you knew who you. I thought you told me that you remembered who Wayne was from back when in '83 when you were there. Is that correct? Yeah, he was. If I remember right, he was a stoner and hung around town here and there. But I don't. Some of the details I don't really remember. I just remember faces. So when you saw his that picture of him that they put on the news, that's how you recognized him. Yeah, but his face used to be filled out. <laughs> The, the time frame that I would have been around and really talking to people, he would have had chubbier cheeks, would have been younger. Right, okay. Um, and then uh, with John, which uh, they never found John, so. And did you know was, him? Uh, yeah. My girlfriend was from Morley Stanwood, and she knew him really well, ex girlfriend, rather. And I dealt with his brothers at Weeks Automotive. At, did you say Weeks? Yeah, Automotive? Yeah, they have a junkyard over in Morley. Oh, yes, John did have a junkyard. His dad owned it, and he ran it for a while. That's right. I did read that. Okay, so let tell, then talk to me about his relationship with Marvin. Do you remember what at that time? I'm talking about when you were knew him in, like, the 80s, early 80s. What are you talking about? Uh, which, whose relationship? John with, with Marvin. There wasn't one then. No? No, he... He was removed from that area. He would not have known him. The only reason I did is because my girlfriend was from there. Huh, I wonder how he came to meet him then. And, and, he moved you know, over he... to Stanwood, or Morley. Uh, Marvin, Marvin did? In... Yeah, he lived in Morley. Oh. It was after okay. I was gone. All right. He moved around a lot. We're having, I've spent two weeks tracking down dates and where he was, and he was all over the place. You know, it was. it's really hard to keep track of where he's was. Why did he move around so much? Do you know? Oh, uh, he was kind of nasty and could get evicted. He wouldn't pay bills and so on and so forth. <laughs> that, that that makes sense just from what I'm reading. I mean, it's crazy how much he moved around. All right. So now when you knew Wayne back in the 80s, was he in that in that same group with all the other guys that we've been discussing? Yeah, they were always around each other. Let's talk about that lake for a minute in the winter. So, you, you did you go ice fishing that one time on that lake or a different lake? No, I did on that lake. If you uh, 
where the creek is, that doesn't really freeze because it's flowing water. Okay, so how big of an area would have been? Oh, okay. Let we know he ended up in that water, and it was February when he went missing. So that unless he kept him in a freezer somewhere and then dumped him later, I'm trying to figure out how he would have gotten him into the water. So that's why I was asking about ice fishing. You know, just put waders on. Uh -huh. And Mark, that guy, would have been not too hard to carry Davis over there, in there. Um, in all the heart of marsh, they would have been frozen in wintertime, so it would have been easy to walk on. And that would have been the only open water. The only open water would have been the creek, then? Yeah. You know, the creek and the lake, it's open in that area there. How far would he be able to get a vehicle into there before he'd have to start carrying them? Well, he would have carried him from the other, uh, the other side there, from the cabin side. That's a long way, isn't it? Oh, that's right, from the cabin where he lived. So down the hill. Yeah. That wouldn't have been that far. And even if he didn't live there at that time, I mean, if my time frame's off, he still would have known about it because he had lived there. Right, right. He was definitely aware of the area. In another excerpt from The Color of Night, about Gabrian's criminal history, the Timmermans wrote, During his 20s and 30s, his record was littered with DUIs and outstanding warrants in several states for failure to appear. These escalated to assault, obstructing police, burglary, larceny, assault with a dangerous weapon, and felony sexual assaults. Since he randomly used eight different aliases, the cases were like shuffling cards, the wonder was how little jail time he had actually done, but anyone in the judicial system would understand. For example, he might have a trial for assault and a key witness or even the plaintiff doesn't appear. Case dismissed. Someone could have a list of DUIs 20 pages long, but they all end in suspended or revoked licenses and a couple months in jail. In the book, they described his arrest. Gabrian was a survivalist. However low his moral character capacities had sunk, Creeping in that void was a primitive, nearly feral instinct for self-protection. He had been on the run for four months, always moving, setting defenses, and planning his next move. He sensed it. Maybe it was the click of a walkie-talkie by the agents in black. He sensed a threat, and he bolted. He's on to us. They raced out the door. Outside the post office, Gabrian ran up a small hill, maybe six feet away and then turned around and ran toward his car. A wall of agents met him up the alley alongside the post office where they took him down. Five or six officers struggled with him. Marvin was not particularly strong, but he fought with demented panic. Finally, one of the officers drew his forty-five and shoved it against Gabriel's temple. They shouted the command, Stop resisting. They cuffed and subdued him. Two blocks down the street was Gabrian's dirty blue sedan with the friendly black dog waiting in the passenger seat. The book also notes that while this takedown was happening, two Amish girls had walked down the street and the FBI agents that spotted them suddenly realized that Gabrian was sporting an Amish-style beard. They wondered if he had taken refuge within that community or just grown the beard as a means of blending in. Gabrian stood trial for social security fraud the following year. This trial occurred in Lansing, Michigan. During that trial, the details about how he had used Robert Allen's ID came out. He used it to rent a room in Grand Rapids the summer Allen went missing, but he got evicted three months into his stay for failing to pay rent. A couple months after that, he opened a bank account in Michigan using Robert Allen's name with an Indiana driver's license. That account was active for a few years, right up until the time Rachel Timmerman was killed. In the end, the court found that he had defrauded the government out of $13,945.94. He'd also sold property in Robert Allen's name, property he didn't even own, and bought what he called his Christian bookstore in Allen's name. That was the home in Altona where he met John Weeks. I spoke by telephone with the wife of a man whose identity Gabriel had stolen to obtain the Virginia driver's license that he had on his person when he was finally arrested. She described to me how her husband had crossed paths with Marvin Gabrion. There was an ad in the local newspaper for a carpenter's position. Her husband called the number to inquire, and the man who answered told him that his office was being remodeled, 
and asked if he could meet him at a local truck stop for an interview. Her husband said that was fine, and so he went to the truck stop where Gabriel proceeded to interview him and then hire him for a position, after which he said all he needed was his information for tax purposes. Gabriel even had a tax form with him, which he had the man fill out. Gabriel informed him of the starting rate of pay, and he completed the paperwork, and then the men parted ways. Two days later, the man got a call from his new employer, informing him that he had broken his leg and they wouldn't be able to start right away. He said he would call back and update him. They waited for a call, but it never came. A year and a half later, they came home to a note on their door from the FBI. Eventually, he learned that his identity had been stolen, and he ended up going to court twice, once in Grand Rapids and another time in Lansing, to testify about what had occurred. Apparently, there were multiple cases of Gabriel assuming the identities of others, and they were stacking the counts of social security fraud against Gabriel while they waited for police to continue their investigation into Rachel's murder. They wanted enough to hold him until that investigation was finished. Nobody wanted Marvin Gabriel out of jail. And fortunately, Gabriel's record gave them plenty to work with. But the boldness of his cunning, in the end, belied his general lack of common sense. If you rape someone and are about to go on trial for it, you have a better chance if you skip town and lay low, and don't continue to steal more people's identities, and certainly don't continue to cash their social security checks after you've killed the person you raped, as well as her baby and two witnesses, in order to keep from going on trial. Those are dots that even Encyclopedia Brown would eventually be able to connect. Gabriel might as well have been leaving breadcrumbs in his wake, the size and shape of the concrete blocks he chained to Rachel Timmerman. It's been said that he has a high IQ, but Gabriel's clearly got very little common sense. If he wanted to skip out on the rape charge and continue to live his life outside prison walls, there were far smarter ways to go about that. But Marvin liked control. He liked manipulation and he liked causing people pain. He got something out of all those things because you don't keep doing them unless you enjoy it. He continued expressing that need for control, as well as showing his penchant for manipulation, while in prison, by sending a fevered flurry of letters to Rachel Timmerman's father, among other people. I mention these letters specifically, because not only would he never admit to killing Rachel's baby, to give the family some measure of relief, he allowed them to believe, in the absence of any facts to support it, that she'd been sold on the black market, he said he was trying to start a non-profit organization and wanted to use Shannon as the poster child. He did this in an effort to get the family to send him a picture of Shannon, which they did because they were desperate for any information about where that sweet little baby was. I won't even tell you what that monster did with that picture once he got it. Gabriel took the stand on March 1st of 2002 and proceeded to read from a series of police reports that he believed, in his current headspace, which seemed purposely disconnected from reality, to confirm only to him that he was innocent. His story was that he was framed by two people who took all the evidence, matching items later found from his Altona house, and helped Rachel Timmerman commit suicide. Yes, suicide, with chains and cement blocks and handcuffs and locks. He further alleged that Rachel had sent him a six-page suicide note. The prosecutor, who had already been up and down objecting a whole hell of a lot that day in court, rose to his feet and demanded to see this note. He wanted the judge to either require this note that had not been included in discovery to be presented to the court or the court to require him to shut the hell up about the fictitious note. The judge calmly insisted that Gabriel should finish his narrative, which, by the way, was all read from a prepared statement. None of it involved questioning by his attorneys. It must have taken the collective patience of all involved to allow him to get through it, and the judge made perfectly clear that the prosecution would have ample time to question him on every absurd thing he said once he took the stand. When Gabriel was done, Don Davis stood up and approached the stand. <coughs> Mr. Gabriel, I would like to take you to the night of August 6, 1996, the night that you raped Rachel Timmerman. The night of the fake rape, yes, sir. Fake rape? Yep. What do you mean by fake rape? It was make-believe. It was fake, so it's fake rape. 
You mean you weren't there? There was no rape, so it had to be fake. You're saying it was some kind of romantic encounter that you had with Rachel Timmerman? It could be more accurately considered a date rape than a rape, but it definitely was nothing romantic involved about it. It wasn't romantic? No. Please explain. Have you read the five page- Please explain. It's not rape, it's not romantic, what is it? It's not what, it's not rape, it's not romantic, then what is it? Yes, that's the question, Mr. Gabrian. It was a 19-year-old prostitute trying to sleep with a 14-year-old boy, and I got caught in the way. That's what it was. Oh, you were dating her, were you? Incorrect. You wrote a letter to Mr. Timmerman, and you referred to that night as the night we dated. Rachel tried to sell me LSD and marijuana the night we dated. That's from your letter. Were you lying to Mr. Timmerman? It's probably not my writing. Oh, it's not your writing. Right. Roberta Gilligan came over to the sheriff's department and tried to charge me for writing letters to the governor and threatening to kill him. The governor helped me start an organization to save babies. That night that you raped Rachel Timmerman, do you recall telling her that if she told police that you would kill her, but not before you killed Shannon and made her watch? Do you remember telling her that to keep her from going to police? Of course not. It never happened either. Do you recall biting her on the nose? No, but she was pushing the car out of the um, sand and, uh... She fell down and hit her nose on the bumper. That might have caused the bleeding on her nose, or or she sat on top of my dog. It could be either one. My dog was midnight black. She sat on your dog. Right, when she... That was the night that you were playing cards with a bunch of individuals, weren't you? Till about midnight. And you went out for a ride? Right, in the convertible. With all of them? Right. And you told all the other passengers to get out of the car? Incorrect. Didn't you? No, she did. She told everyone to get out. Then she said, take me down by the river and I'll suck your dick. Now, Mr. Gabrian, what is it that made you so immediately irresistible to Rachel Timmerman that night? She said she thought I was extremely powerful looking for a man, or for a white man or something like that is what she said. She was extremely drunk. And when you returned to your campsite on the Little Muskegon River, you had bruises on your face, you had scratches on your neck, and you were missing hair. Rachel struggled, didn't she? Rachel scratched you, didn't she? Rachel tried to live, didn't she? Wrong. She didn't try to live? She passively sat there while you bound her mouth and her eyes and her body and threw her in the lake? She didn't scratch? I didn't bind her at all. She scratched you, didn't she? No. Mr. Gabriel, the witness, testified that on the morning of June 6, 1997, he was awoken about 4 a.m. Heard you drag a boat across the gravel, take the boat into the garage, and grind something off it at the bow. Before you did that, you took three blocks and a chain out of the boat, and you later put them back and took off in your pickup truck. My simple question to you, sir, is, we know where two of the blocks are. They're government exhibits 17 and 14. Where's the third block? What did you do with it? There was no three blocks in my boat, period. No blocks? No blocks. Rachel Timmerman was on the shores of Oxford Lake on that day, alive and unbound. My question to you, sir, is did you suffocate her on the shore, or did you take her into the lake and drown her? I never killed Rachel Timmerman, period. I didn't have anything to do with it. I was nowhere near around where she was when she expired, either. I know Fast Eddie and John Weeks were there, and that Eddie had planned on killing her. I know exactly where Eddie's cabin is, if you care, to know where that is, so you can go check it out. After you used the boat to take Rachel out onto that lake, after you bound her mouth, because she was talking too much, after you bound her eyes, and after you threw her into the lake alive, and watched the bubbles rising... You took that boat someplace where you didn't think it could be found, didn't you? You're trying to say that I took that boat to my Christian bookstore with a neighbor watching me, and now you're trying to say I hid the boat too? You took the boat on the afternoon of June 6th to the Little Miss... Is there supposed to be a yes or no answer to that? Why don't you let me finish? You took the boat on the afternoon of June 6th to the campsite of Jenny Bingham on the Little Muskegon River, didn't you? No, I did not. And you didn't want that boat at your campsite just to tad up the river? I didn't have a campsite on the Little Muskegon River. After three weeks of storing your boat on the Little Muskegon River, you thought you'd gotten away with it, didn't you? I always owned a boat. I told you I always had a fishing boat, so why should I be hiding a boat? Is there something about my questions you don't understand? After three weeks... I never hid any boat. That's the thing I don't understand about the question. I didn't even talk about hiding the boat. I asked you, after three weeks, you thought you had gotten away with it, didn't you? Nobody surfaced, did it? No, I don't... I, I never thought that I ever did any murder, so why would I think that I had gotten away with it? Wait, what? You think what you did to Rachel Timmerman is justified and not murder? 
No, I don't think what you did to her is justifiable at all. I think what you did is you forced her to testify in a case against a person, lying in a case which forced her to become a victim to a crime. You and these prosecutors and the police, you know what you did. She knows what you did, and you're going to pay for it at God's judgment, period. She got what she deserved, didn't she? From you. Rachel Timmerman got what she deserved, didn't she? And haven't you told that to a lot of people? Wrong. And after three weeks, you thought you had pulled it off. You thought you'd gotten away with it, and then you thought... Why let a good boat go to waste? Might as well... What boat are you talking about, sir? The boat that you used to take Rachel Timmerman into the middle of the south portion of Oxford Lake. The boat that you used to murder Rachel Timmerman. That boat. The boat that you stored away from your campsite on the Little Muskegon River. The boat that you ground the numbers off of. The boat that you put two and maybe three cement blocks and a chain in. That's the boat we're talking about, sir. Is there more than one boat in this case? You asked me, sir, what boat. I told you what boat. You thought, at the end of three weeks, you might as well sell the boat, didn't you? Where did I sell it at, then, if you're such a know-it-all? Just answer the question, yes or no, if you can. Can you repeat the question? Yes. After three weeks, sir, you thought you'd gotten away with it. You thought, why let a good boat go to waste? And you tried to sell it, didn't you? You brought it back to your store, the store, your home in Altona, and put a for-sale sign on the boat, the murder weapon, didn't you? Incorrect. You didn't put that boat for sale? Right. The neighbors weren't driving down Five Mile Road and saw a for sale sign and stopped by to talk to you about it? About some boat, but not the boat. The boat that you used to kill Rachel Timmerman was a different boat? There was no boat used to kill Rachel Timmerman to begin with. How did you get her body out in the middle of the lake? By you in that state police helicopter. <laughs> and where did I in that state police helicopter remove her body from, if you know, and you apparently do? From the north side of the private lake where you put the blocks on her. Where do you think? Where you and Tim Timmerman put the two cinder blocks on her. How many blocks were on her before that? The two that you put on her. You're claiming that I put two blocks on her? That's correct. With Mr. Timmerman's help? That's right. Then you used a state police helicopter to put her in the water. Did I first put her in the north end of the lake? Right. Over there where you put your thick, fat finger. I put my fat finger on the north end of the lake. That's right, right there. See where the island is? That's where you dropped her. No, that's, that, no, that's, that's where the, if you take your pointer down to the, down towards you, towards your waist, down, down, towards your waist. Move your pointer towards your waist from where you had it. Take the pointer and move it from, you're just doing it on purpose because you don't want to know exactly where the cabin is or what actually happened on purpose. Mr. Gabriel, when I and Tim Timmerman dropped her at some portion of the north end of the lake, how many blocks did we put on her? You put two of them, two blocks on in the woods, and then later on, you picked her up with a helicopter and you put her right out there in the water. Were you watching from someplace? Yeah, from where God always watches people like you. You, God, were watching from someplace? That's right. Where? You know where. Tell me. You know where. Tell me. You know where. That's not an answer. Yes, it is. You're referring to yourself as God? I'm referring to myself as what I am and who I am. God? What I am and who I am. Is that with a capital G? It's not starting with a P like prosecutors, that's for sure. When you portray yourself as God, do you ever draw pictures of yourself as God? No, do you? Do you put three eyes on your God? No. Do you call yourself Azza? The defense objected and the judge sustained, but the courtroom was riveted. The three-eyed god business came from a picture that Gabriel had drawn of his alleged aborted daughter from a woman that he had impregnated at some point. He sent this letter to Rachel's dad, Tim Timmerman. Aza was the name he had given this alleged aborted daughter. The line of questioning that he'd stepped into had Marvin seething on the stand, but the prosecutor need not go any further. The interaction between them had the desired result. He could tell by the rapt attention of the jurors. Then the line of questioning went into whether Marvin had asked his mother to go over to the Christian bookstore he called home and get rid of evidence. At the time, family members had been caught red-handed and one of the detectives made them unload everything they had removed into the exact spots from which they'd taken them. Marvin accused his mother of planting the only book found in the so-called bookstore. The title? The Perfect Victim. According to Amazon.com, it's about a girl who'd been hitchhiking and took a ride with a couple named Cameron and Janice Hooker, and they ended up holding her captive as a sex slave for years. So for those of you counting the books in what Marvin Gabriel referred to as his Christian bookstore, 
That's zero Bibles and one story of depravity. That was the only book in the entire place. When asked how he learned to assume identities like he had multiple times during his life, Marvin said that he learned to do it when he was a kid and that the CIA had trained him to do it. By the end of the testimony, any credibility that he may have had when he took the seat was strained past any point of recovery. But he didn't sound crazy. He sounded like someone who wanted people to think he was crazy, or just crazy enough that any verdict might get tossed on appeal. One of the most unsettling things that the jurors learned is the extent to which Marvin Gabrion had tormented Rachel's family while in prison. The man sent letter after letter stringing them along about Shannon, feeding their hope that she might be alive somewhere, until it eventually became clear that he never had any intention to provide any clarity in that regard. Whatever happened to that beautiful little girl, only God and the monster know. But the prosecutor tried, he really did. Like Detective Miller, Tim Timmerman, and everyone before him that had asked, even fellow inmates, they all tried to no avail. Didn't you also say that she's not in the lake because I didn't drown her? You killed her another way, didn't you? I don't know what you're talking about now. Shannon is not in the lake because you didn't drown her. How'd you kill Shannon? Shannon's not dead. And lastly, sir, you heard an earlier witness testify that you told him that you killed the baby because there was no place to put it. Was that your motive to kill Shannon? Because there was no place to put it? Is that the character of the witnesses you're going to keep repeating the testimony of? You won't answer the question, will you? Will you, sir? You won't tell this jury. You won't tell anyone that the reason that you killed Shannon is because you had no place to put her. You're a liar. That's the reason that What more can I say? You're just lying and you keep lying and lying and lying, so what can I say? Is that the reason? Yes, you're lying. Is that the reason that you killed an 11-month-old because you had no place to put her? Incorrect. Then why'd you kill her? I didn't kill her. Why did you kill her mother? I didn't kill either of them. Never. Thou shall not kill. You killed her mother. Two wrongs don't make a right. Thou shall not kill. Be quiet. You killed her mother. Make me. You killed her mother because she was going to testify against you, didn't you? Incorrect. And you put her body... I never killed either one of them. It's thou shall not kill. Two wrongs don't make a right. And you put her body... Live it. Learn it. And you took her alive with tape across her mouth because she was talking too much. No, someone else did that. And you put her in Oxford Lake and watched the bubbles rise, didn't you? Wrong. And you enjoyed seeing the bubbles rise, didn't you? No. Never happened. I have nothing further, Your Honor. The trial was all but over by then, save some testimony from the defense that efforted to help the jury draw conclusions based on fingerprints being on the tape, or the lack thereof, to which the prosecutor had to simply address one question. Isn't the chance of finding fingerprints substantially lessened if the person is wearing gloves? Remember, one of the campers who had seen Gabriel commented about how he was always wearing gloves, even in front of a fire or when it was warm. The jury was sequestered for the weekend and came back with a verdict on Tuesday, March 5, 2002. When they filed in, they were treated to the ever-defiant Marvin Gabriel sitting at the defense table with Azza, A-Z-Z-A, scrawled across his forehead. And how did it end? Guilty. The verdict was guilty. There is zero doubt that Marvin Gabriel is guilty of the murder of Rachel Timmerman and the disappearance of her baby girl. It is highly likely that the baby succumbed to the same fate, though I suspect that to this day her family still holds out hope that Gabriel sold her to some loving family and she's still out there somewhere, that the possibility of a beautiful reunion exists for them all. Maybe one day, that something, anything positive, can come from this whole monstrous affair. And what about the others? Wayne Davis was found, although no person has ever been held to account for his murder. It's pretty clear what happened to him. Robert Allen, John Weeks, Baby Shannon. Did they all share the same fate? All at the hands of Marvin Gabriel? In their cases, it seems likely. But the families, they don't know. They don't know for sure. The weight of a thousand questions must sit heavily on their shoulders. What happened? Where are they? Where did he put them? Was he scared? Did she suffer? Hope is an interesting thing. Emily Dickinson described it this way. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm 
that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. I respectfully beg to disagree with Miss Dickinson. I've always believed that a little hope is a dangerous thing. Indeed, hope often asks more than we're able to withstand. Hope can be painful. Hope can remain forever an unfulfilled promise. And yet, we still hope. Because sometimes even with the pain, hope is simply all that we have. Hello? Hello, Chad. Hello. Chad Gregory went by the name of Taz in 1997, during the time period when he was friendly with a guy by the name of John Weeks. Meeting John was kind of uh, interesting, honestly. Um, what I didn't know, uh, when I thought I originally met him, was that I had actually met him a few times for about a year, uh, on and off for about a year prior, because he had done work at Week's Junkyard, which was previously owned by his grandfather, and, uh, from what I understand from John, uh, his grandfather had actually left to him, but because he was a minor, his aunt, uh, was, uh, basically in control of it until he turned 18, and she turned around and sold it to his uncle, um, without, well, pretty much without his permission. He had been doing work on and off, uh, over the years at Week's Junkyard, uh, as a late teen and, uh, early adult. And Week's Junkyard is one of the junkyards I used to go to to pick up parts for cars and stuff. I've spoken with John's mother a number of times, and she confirmed that there had been an issue about the sale of the junkyard. John was upset about it, and that would certainly be something that went to his state of mind leading up to when he went missing. When police look at cases like this, even if there's a strong suspicion that foul play was involved, in the absence of a body and any physical evidence that a crime befell the victim, they have to look at everything that could also point to the idea that the person may have decided to leave town and start a new life. But in this case, we also have to look at the fact that there's been no activity on his social security number, he's never contacted any family or friends over the ensuing decades, and there's no physical evidence to suggest that he ever left town with Marvin Gabrion, who was actually John's boss at the time, except he went by the name of Lance, an alias that he often used, and he had moved to an area called Altona, where the locals wouldn't have known him. You might remember in my last episode, the man I spoke to said John wouldn't have known Marvin as Marvin because he was removed from the area where he lived. He only met him when Gabriel moved to the Morley area where the Altona house was. It appears that Marvin was keeping his distance from his old stomping grounds and the rape charges that were dogging him. But it wasn't long before police started connecting the dots as far as people who were going missing and their associations with Marvin Gabriel which is why law enforcement was contacting people like Chad, who had connections to John Weeks, the most recent Gabrian associate to have gone missing. I had met him periodically over there at the junkyard, and uh, I guess uh, I guess I'd met him briefly just in passing uh, when I like picked up Allie, uh, Aline. She was his girlfriend, Aline, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And at that time, we're talking in 19... 19- 97 when he went missing. So he was around 20. Were you the same age? Yeah, I was like 21, 20, something like that. The first police report I have associated with his case was from Macosta County, who assisted Nuego County. Um, and so what happened in the police report that I got is parts of it, just the parts of it where they started the missing person section. And in it, you had said that um, during that time period from May 25th, 1997 to June 27th of 1997, um, you guys had spent almost every day together. Does that sound right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it varied on different days. Um, but yeah, we pretty much at least hung out for at least a few hours almost every single day. Uh, I was friends with Aline, and when him and Aline started dating, uh, she invited him to hang out with us. Okay. So let's start with 
There came a, a point when um, John got kicked out of his grandmother's house. Do you know what happened as far as that altercation? It only says there was an issue with, with Aline, actually, but the report doesn't say exactly what happened. Yeah, I don't, uh, I actually don't recall why he got kicked out of his grandmother's. And he didn't have a vehicle at the time, did he? No, uh, actually, I was, I was the only one with a vehicle. Then where does he start living? He was bouncing around from friend's house to friend's house. Um, if memory serves me correctly, I had him stay at my place for a few days. Detective Sergeant Rao with the Macosta County Sheriff's Department had been contacted by Detective Robert Van Belzen, an investigator with the Nuego County Sheriff's Department, in mid-August of 1997, about a month after Marvin Gabriel had last been seen in the Nuego area with John Weeks at a campsite near Hungerford Lake. This was a little over a year after Rachel Timmerman reported being raped by Marvin Gabriel. During this time, Rachel did five months in jail for a probation violation and, ironically, that five-month stint kept her out of harm's way because just nine days after she was incarcerated, sheriff's deputies arrested Marvin Gabriel for her rape. He went in on January 20th, and two weeks later, on February 4th, he got out of jail. The judge had set bond at $75,000 because he had a rap sheet including assaults and robberies and a veritable feast of DUI charges. His lawyers got that bail reduced to 40000 and Marvin was able to manipulate friends and family into bailing him out. Wayne Davis went missing eight days after Marvin walked out of jail. The day after Wayne went missing, he was supposed to turn himself in to serve a 90-day stint for a previous DUI. Wayne never showed. On May 5th, a few months after Wayne went missing, Rachel Timmerman was released from jail. Twice in the month after, she called 911 to say that Marvin Gabriel was following her. During this time is when John Weeks began calling her. Finally, they made a date, and on that fateful night, Rachel said goodbye to her dad, and along with her baby, left the house on June 3rd, a month after she had been released from jail. The next day, John Weeks and Marvin Gabriel, or Lance, as John knew him, were seen by multiple people in a truck with Rachel near Oxford Lake, where she would later be found. The next night, a neighbor saw Gabriel cleaning out his boat and using a grinder to remove the registration number. Then, Marvin went out of town to mail the letters he'd made Rachel write to her father, a judge, and the detective, retracting her rape allegation in the latter two and telling her father that she had left town with the love of her life. John Weeks was seen at a party around the time Marvin was out of town mailing those letters. The Macosta County Sheriff's Department had been called to that party for a noise complaint. The next day, his grandmother made both John and his girlfriend leave her home. John was no longer allowed to live there. The report doesn't go into detail about why, other than to note that there was a disturbance and assault at the residence involving John's girlfriend. As a result of that, Grandma Weeks asked them to leave immediately. His grandmother said John returned two or three days later to get some belongings, and that was the last time she ever saw him. About a week later, Lance knocked on Grandma Weeks' door looking for John. Not finding him there, he went to Howard City to where John's girlfriend was living at the time. According to the report, he told multiple people he wanted his dope or his money, though Chad doesn't remember it quite that way from his conversation with Marvin. During this time, John is bouncing around, sleeping everywhere from Chad's car to a barn loft and under a bridge in Howard City. It looks to me like he was trying to lay low, maybe even hide from the guy he calls Lance. The report says that Chad tells police the last time he saw John was June 27th, about a week or so after the last time his grandmother sees him. But he does remember speaking with him a few days later on July 4th on the phone. So do you, do you recall when the last time you remember seeing him was or what occurred on that occasion? I don't remember everything that happened that day. Um, I do, I do remember quite vividly, uh, a discussion just before I dropped him off in Howard City that day. Um, he had said something about, uh, he had found some, uh, temporary work and, uh, he wasn't going to be around for a few days. And, uh, Allie and I were just like, okay, you know, just keep in touch. So he didn't say what the work was or where it was? No. Okay. So in the report, it says that that 
um, the last day you saw him, I believe, was the 27th, if I'm not mistaken. But then there's a um, incident. It says that you got a call on July 9th from his boss. Do you remember that? Yep. Uh, a guy that I knew by the, at that time of uh, by the name of Lance somehow, I don't know how, got my parents' phone number, which is where I was staying at, uh, and called me wanting to know if I knew where to find John at. And I told him I hadn't seen him in a while. But I had talked to him a couple days, uh, a few days before that. You talked to him on the phone, you mean? Yeah. Okay, so he called you, or you were, did he have, how did he, how was he able to get in touch with you? If memory serves me correctly, I believe he actually called me from his grandmother's place. This is around the same time that Rachel Timmerman's body is found in Oxford Lake. In the next few days, the news would report on the story and it wouldn't be long before the public knew that that body was Rachel Timmerman. A week after Rachel's body was found, Marvin is still pretending to be Lance, and he calls Chad, someone he has never met, looking for John. I think by now Marvin was determined to find and kill John Weeks. To Marvin, John was just another witness to his bad deeds, and Marvin Gabrion did not leave witnesses. On July 18th, police got a tip that Marvin was spotted at Hungerford Lake, camping. When police arrived, they found baby bottle nipples and a barrette, but no Gabrian, and no sign of John Weeks. Police would catch up with Marvin Gabrian two months later in Sherman, New York, when he'd be taken into custody. But John Weeks was never seen again. What it says in the report is that um, the, his boss, Lance, told you that he had, John had ripped him off for 90 bucks and he better get his money back or else. Do you remember that? No, uh, what I remember is that Lance had called me, said that John owed him some money, and he just wanted to find out where he was to find out when he was going to get paid back. And I told him I didn't know where he was or, or, or anything. And matter of fact, the last time I had talked with John, uh, John had actually called me because he didn't want to call Allie and break the news to her. Um, he said that he was going to go with Lance on one of his runs down to Texas for religious books for his bookstore and that Lance was going to drop him off on the way in Arizona. Why was he dro- going to Arizona? Um, I guess he had lived there uh, at some point in time and had a lot of friends there. John did? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if true that was or anything, because I never had any proof from John that he actually lived there. John's mother told me that they had lived in Arizona. She and her best friend lived in Phoenix, and she had taken John there for a short time after he had inherited a bit of money in the hopes that he wouldn't blow it and maybe get a job and gain some independence. But according to her, it didn't work out, and they weren't there for very long before they returned to Michigan. According to her, he didn't make any friends in Phoenix because He stayed in the apartment most of the time, and usually he was with her when they did go out. She described John as shy and quiet at the time, his only friends being the sons of her best friend. So when he first told you that he was, you and Allie together, that he was going to be out of town for a few days, that wasn't, that was something separate than the, than the, the next time you heard from him that he was going on a trip with Lance? Yeah. Okay, so he had gotten some kind of work, he thought, and then Lance calls you looking for him. And he says he's going out of town with him to go get religious books. And it was a few days before Lance called me. He said that he was going to go out of town, that Lance had a run to make to Texas to pick up a uh, religious book for his book, uh, religious bookstore. And oh. that Lance was going to drop him off in Phoenix, in Arizona, on his way to Texas. And why, so he was wanting you to break the news that he wasn't coming back to Aline? No, he didn't want to be the one to tell Aline that uh, he was going to be going to Phoenix for a couple of months. And what was he, did he say why he had picked Phoenix and what he was going to be doing there? Because he had friends he could stay with and he was, I think he felt like he had run out of places to stay around this, around this area. And so he was, I guess, Hoping to to get a new start with the help of old friends in Phoenix, Arizona. All right, and and 
Lance was the one that was going to take him there and drop him off. Yeah. Does anything about him, his that conversation sound weird to you? No, because he had said some, uh, he had said a few things to me, uh, just in brief mention about how he used to live in Phoenix, Arizona, how he had friends there, that he had had thoughts about going back there, um, to try to get back on his feet again. Okay. And this was before this whole, uh, before he ended up making this actual plan of going with, uh, Lance. All right, so you don't remember there being any argument as far as between Lance and him about any money that was taken from him? No. Okay. Lance had just loaned him some money, and he was just looking to get paid back. I see. And I knew John had said that a friend of his had uh, some sort of, I guess it was like a construction-type job as a... Little side, like side project, like a, like maybe a roofing project or a drywall project or something. Right. That wanted him to help him with and he was going to pay him for it. In those couple days, that, that was the job that he was going to have for those couple days. Yeah. Before, before he yeah. just went out of town. Okay. So he was going to stay down in Grand Rapids. Okay. So it was in Grand Rapids where that job was supposed to be? I think. All I, all I clearly remember is him saying that it was out of town. I think it was Grand Rapids, maybe Holland or something like that. Um, but he was going to be gone for a few days, maybe a week or so. Okay. And before that call from his boss, Lance, had you ever met his boss before? No. I had heard John talk about him and that he did, uh, he did work, um, like unloading books from, from the van and, and trucks and, uh, putting them up in the bookstore, sorting and stuff like that for him. John had said that to you? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because when they went to that house to search it, there was only one book in there, and it was a like a creepy serial killer type book. It was never wow. a store as far as I am aware. He might have wanted it to be, but... I know the place was a storefront at one time years and years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually like a little general store way uh -huh. day when it was first built. Um... And I don't know how Lance came into possession of it or anything like that. And I didn't even really know the place even was there until after all this stuff happened. And I went to that little town just outside of, uh, what, outside of Stanwood, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And I just went by just to see what the place looked like that the cops were asking me about. And... I mean, it just looked like a run-down old store that nobody was using. Marvin Gabriel had purchased a store under the name of Robert Allen, who was still missing. Gabriel had been cashing his social security checks for a couple years when he moved to the Altona area to hide out. Now, I call it a store because it had once been an old general store, but it was really an old house, and for some reason he had decided he was going to open up a Christian bookstore. I have no idea why, given how small Altona is, I doubt any kind of bookstore would have done enough business to stay afloat. I suspect that it was more about telling people about it, using the word Christian to try to wear it as some sort of mask, a facade to cover the fact that he'd killed multiple people. Killers often have a come-to-Jesus moment, at least publicly. It's usually for show, generally as a means of hiding their true evil. About a week before police got a tip that Marvin was camping out near Hungerford Lake, Police got a search warrant for the old Altona property. Neighbors said that neither he or John Weeks had been seen around there in a while. According to Robert Allen's sister, he'd met Gabriel at an AA meeting. She didn't know much about him except that when they had searched the Altona house, they found some of her brother's ID in the walls of the house, as well as his glasses. That little tidbit floored me. They were thick black glasses that I suppose Gabriel could have kept and worn while trying to assume his identity, but the very idea of killing someone and keeping their glasses is kind of gruesome, particularly since I saw no evidence that Alan had even been in the Altona area. It's much more likely that Marvin killed him and disposed of him in the Grand Rapids area, where they were both living at the time. Yeah, I had heard that he had made some uh, bookshelves or something for him, uh, was building bookshelves for Lance, but do you know how often he was actually working and getting paid by him? Uh... 
usually just whenever Lance called him and told him that he needed his help. So, like, not even on a a, a weekly basis, just here and there? Yeah, my, uh, I think it was maybe a couple days a week at that, and, and some weeks not at all, and, you know, other weeks he'd have him work maybe three or four days. All right. Did he ever say anything about him, anything negative about him? Like he was uncomfortable with him or anything like that, John, about Lance? He actually always talked very highly of him. Did he? Okay. Huh. Do you remember anything specific he said about him? Um, I don't know that he was a nice guy. He, you know, he paid him good for when he did have him work. Okay. That's right. All this, all this, thing, all this whole, you know, John disappearing and... Lance turning out to be this Marvin Gabriel and him being responsible for, for that girl's death and, and her baby's death. It, it knocked me for a loop, honestly. Did you know Rachel Timmerman? Yes, I, I actually knew her. Um, I had no, I, I had met her and hung out with her for a little while, a couple of years prior, um, through some mutual friends. Um, I was friends with this, uh, girl named Shauna Lovers and friends of hers that lived in Cedar Springs. Um, one of her friends was actually dating Rachel and we went over to Rachel's house one day to hang out in the backyard. So, I mean, I have like a long term like friendship with her, but we had hung out a few days here and there. Uh, over the course of, uh, oh, I think it would have been the spring of, uh, 95, I think. Okay. So that's a couple years earlier. Did you know that, uh, that John had been calling her? No, I had no clue. The thing about him going missing is that, uh, it is interesting that he did have some ties to Arizona because that wasn't the impression that I was getting in my reading. But you saying that he had mentioned when you spoke to police, did you is that what you told them to when they in, um, talked to you? I assume they talked to you a couple times. Uh, actually, yeah, um, they actually had me come down to Grand Rapids and do a polygraph. Oh, my God. <laughs> really? Yeah, because the, the description of the last person seen with Rachel had a baseball cap, glasses, long hair, and was driving a blue Chevy. I fit the description because I had long hair. Ba I always wore a baseball cap. I had glasses. Uh, and, and I was driving a dark blue four-door uh, Chevy uh, car. And I asked them. I was like, the, the detective from Acosta County that talked to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, what color blue was it? He was like, well, it's like a regular blue. I was like, okay, well. I pointed to my car, and I said, you see that car right there? I was like, that's dark blue. Can't be the same car. I was like, how many doors did the car have? He's like, well, it was a two-door. I was like, see that car right there? That's a four-door. That's my car. That's the only car I drive. So the po the person that was last seen with her supposedly had a baseball cap on and long hair and was driving yeah, a blue Chevy. Like I pointed out to the cop, the, the detective that came and talked to me. I was like... Right now, for five bucks, you can go to Walmart and buy these baseball caps with this fake long hair attached to it. I'm not sure if this was just the description of the last person seen with John up to that point, and they learned differently as the investigation moved forward, or if police were fibbing to gauge Chad's reaction because they were trying to decide whether he had somehow assisted John in getting Rachel to come out with him that night. According to her father, Rachel had told him that a boy had asked her out on a dinner date and she'd be back in a few hours. She told her father the boy had asked her to bring baby Shannon along. That's all police knew up to that point, that someone had picked Rachel up for a date. But it wouldn't be long before witnesses began describing a blonde woman in a truck with two men that fit the description of Marvin Gabrion, whose faces had been plastered all over TV, as well as John Weeks, a guy who did some work for a man who lived in a rundown old store in Altona, who went by the name of Lance. And this Lance was a man described by neighbors as looking suspiciously like Marvin Gabriel. And now John Weeks was missing, too. What the narrative that we know fails to illuminate is what John Weeks knew and when he knew it. He was seen in the truck with Rachel and Gabriel at the Oxford Lake ramp, but not seen when Gabriel was speeding away, almost running a couple off the road. 
Did he witness what Gabriel did or was about to do and then left on foot? That's a hell of a remote area. If he knew anything at all about what Marvin had done to Rachel and her baby, why would he be days later at a campground with Gabriel helping him try to hide his boat? Which Gabriel was clearly doing. It's hard to imagine that he watched Marvin, or Lance as he knew him, wrap a woman's eyes and mouth with duct tape, chain two cinder blocks to her and help him get her into a boat or, God forbid, get in the boat with them. But how do we explain him being on the shore of Oxford Lake on what appears to be the day she was dumped into that lake? Either he knew exactly what Marvin did, he participated, and he's as monstrous as Gabrian, or he was another person Marvin was able to manipulate and then he met a similar fate after getting more involved with him than he had initially bargained for. I was eventually able to locate an interview with a witness associated with John Weeks, and it suggests that he had some knowledge, and from what it sounds like, may have even participated, if the witness is to be believed. Actually, it's two witnesses. Chris and Ted took a ride to Grand Rapids that summer, right around the time Rachel went missing, to buy some pot and John Weeks went with them. The following is from a transcript done by law enforcement with Ted. Chris would essentially back up this story when he was questioned. Just to note, this transcript began regarding another crime and what this witness knew about that, and then they got into the discussion of John Weeks. Okay, just before I turned on the tape, you said you knew of something that was worse than that. What were you talking about? About John Weeks. Who's John Weeks? He lives in Morley. I was kind of friends with him for a little while. Um. When were you friends with him? Over the summer. This summer? Last summer? Uh, this summer. Where did John Weeks live? Right in Morley. I don't know the name of the road. He lived with his grandmother. Where did his grandmother live? Right behind my girlfriend's grandma's. I I don't know the name of the road. So would it be right behind there, like one block behind there, or one house? The next road. The next road to the west. Toward the freeway? Yeah, in the second house from the corner. What color is the house? White. Okay, what's worse about Mr. Weeks than the other case? Well, we were in the car. Whose car? Um, we were in Chris's car. John had... No, wait, we were in my car. I was taking him to Grand Rapids. We went down to Grand Rapids to buy some weed, and, um, John had, like, eight, nine hundred dollars. He said he made that in one night or something. We asked him how he made it, and he said, um, he picked up some woman for the guy that he worked for, and he brought her to his house, and he killed her. Was he there when he killed her? Yes. He he acted like, I think he's the one that got rid of the body. What do you mean by that? Because he said, he's like, I seen it. I seen him kill her. Or something like that. Then I helped get rid of her. Something like that. Did he say how he got rid of her? No, but I... You guys didn't ask? I just thought he was bullshitting, you know? You didn't hear nothing about no murders on or nothing. And, and just lately on TV, you hear about them finding a body of a woman and... And how John's missing and somebody else is missing and and then they found that guy in another state. What guy? I can't remember his name now. Did John happen to say who he was, who he did this with? He told me his name, but I don't remember. I know it's the same guy that... How do you know? Do you recognize the name? Yeah, but I don't... I don't remember that name now. Was the name Gabriel? I think so. Tell me to the best that you can remember what exactly he said. He said that he went and picked her up, picked a woman up, and that was the guy's girlfriend. Did he mention anything about a little kid? No, but he he said he went and picked a woman up and he brought her um he brought her to the guy's house and he just said that uh said that about one thing he said that she owed him money or something. Then later on, he said that it was his girlfriend and that he was at he said that they killed her. Whose girlfriend? Weeks or the other guy? The other guys. So he went and picked her up, took her to the other guy's house. Did he say where the house was? No, but um I remember him saying that the guy was was who he worked for and stuff. Did he say what the guy did? Uh, he'd done other stuff. I think he was selling coke for him or something. He said he saw him kill her? Yeah. Did he say how? He goes, I brought her there so he could kill her, and I seen it. Okay, you said you thought he got rid of the body. What made you think that? Just the way he talked about it, acted about it. Meaning? He was like, I helped, I helped do it, or something like that. I helped get rid of her. Did he say, I helped get rid of her? He said he helped him with it pretty much, is what he didn't actually say, I did help kill her. He he helped get rid of her, he said. I helped him with it. How come you didn't report this thing to anybody? I just, I, I didn't really, I figured it's kind of hearsay, you know, because John, 
I didn't know. It's kind of hearsay. He told us that a long time ago. At the time, I thought he was bullshitting. When did you take this trip to Grand Rapids, do you recall? Oh, a long, uh, quite a while ago. I, I don't even remember what month it was. It was, it was in the summer. When's the last time you saw Mr. Weeks? Three, four months ago, three months ago. And where was that? The last time I seen him, it was in town by the store. I talked to him for a second, and I seen his girlfriend, and she said that he was in jail or something. Where was he in jail at? I don't know. That's just what she said. He's in jail or something. That they broke up, and that she never seen him again. Who's his girlfriend? Oh, shit, I think, I can't remember her name. John's grandma knows her. Where's she from? Howard City. Can you describe her to me? Uh, she's about 5'5", five, five, long hair, skinny. What kind of vehicle did John have? Uh, John didn't have one. John have any other friends that you know of? Uh-uh. Nobody? Every time I seen John, he was with just him and his girlfriend. Does Chris know John? Yeah. How does Chris know him? Same way I do, from the time he's... I met him in the summer, pretty much. He's... He said this in front of me and Chris. Chris wrote home to his dad about it, asking his dad to find out if there was anything about him, if they found John or anything like that, but I don't know. I just, I didn't really think much of it. I figured I didn't know for sure 100%, so I didn't say anything. What'd you guys do when you went to Grand Rapids? Went and bought a bag of weed. You did get some weed? Where'd you go? A house. I, I don't know the address. Somebody you know or somebody he knows? Somebody I knew, but I did didn't... Did he spend any of his money to buy some drugs or no? Yeah, that's why I knew it was weird that he had so much money, because he gave me a hundred dollars, you know? I was kind of friends with him, and but not really that good of friends, and he handed me two hundred dollars thinking that he had given me a hundred, and I went in and got two hundred dollars worth of pot, and I came back, and I was going to give... I gave him a hundred dollars worth, and he never said nothing about the other hundred, so I knew he had just way too much money, you know? He didn't just... He didn't just uh, go make that a hard day's work, you know? Because he didn't even have a clue. He, he had a roll that thick of money. You're indicating an inch thick. He had a couple thousand dollars. At least a thousand. I guarantee it. I honestly think he's dead. Why do you think that? I think maybe he... That guy got worried about what he knew, was worried about him saying something, maybe telling people about it, because John's missing, and whoever that other guy is, they're both missing, right? It's not my case. I'm not sure of all the facts. In the paper, it says two people, John Weeks and somebody else, both missing, and, and they're both suspects in it. And they found that other guy, Gabriel, or whatever the hell his name is. But you don't remember him mentioning any names in the car? No. I'm positive that's who he was working for, though. Why? He would go to work and he would come back with like 100 to 200 dollars, you know, like that, all of a sudden. He would go where? To that guy's house. Would you be willing to talk to the other detectives about this? Yeah. Ten days before John Weeks was last seen, during the time he was apparently hiding out from him, Marvin Gabrion was spotted at another local lake. Too Good Lake. The timing makes me wonder if he was scoping that lake out for another possible body dump site. This time maybe John Weeks. On July 9th of 1997, a man called in a tip about a suspicious sighting from when he and his girlfriend were on vacation camping near Too Good Lake, horseback riding and fishing. The day prior to this suspicious sighting, someone had entered their campsite and stolen their home light chainsaw. According to them, this theft had put them on guard for unusual suspects. On the day of the strange sighting, the man was busy cleaning fish when a burgundy-colored Chrysler New Yorker pulled into the campsite. The vehicle was occupied by a male driver and two females who were seated in the back seat. One female appeared to be much older than the other. The male then proceeded to climb out of the vehicle through the open driver's side window, walked up to him and asked for a beer. The whites of his eyes were bloodshot, and they were both black and blue, like he'd gotten into a fight. There was a cut over one eye. He was shirtless, wearing cut-off pants and no shoes. During their conversation, the woman in the car referred to him as Mark. At least that's what the man thought he heard. But I should note that many people call Marvin Gabrion Marv. When this Mark asked for a beer, the man said, I don't think so. The strange man became very aggressive, yelling, you're not going to be friendly about it, are you? And then he said, I'll give you five bucks for one. The camper again said no, worried that because of his aggressive nature, they might be working toward a fight. The conversation, while confrontational, included the stranger discussing his personal life, saying that he lived outdoors most of the time, staying at campgrounds, and he frequently moved after four or five days. He said he had previously spent some time at Too Good Lake camping. 
At one point in the conversation, he reached down and put one of the man's dogs in a headlock. As the conversation amped up, the women in the car called for the stranger, and that's when the man thought he heard the name Mark. The women were calling and saying they wanted to leave, and so the stranger got back into the car and drove away. The quick-thinking tipster took down the license plate of the vehicle, and that vehicle was traced to a woman with ties to Marvin Gabriel. Where that car ended up is also interesting. In the July 13th edition of the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette newspaper, there was an ad listing a 1994 Chrysler for sale for $400. A man named Lester saw that ad, and because his 16-year-old needed a car, he called the number. It ended up being a motel in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, this was nine days after Rachel Timmerman was last seen, right about the same time frame as John Weeks was last heard from, and about three weeks after the strange man had rolled up on some campers at Too Good Lake demanding beer. Now, Lester wants to buy this car, so he, along with his ex-wife and his son, head over to the Value Lodge and make contact with the man in room 217, which the advertisement had listed. The man said he was keeping the car at a truck stop about two blocks away from the motel, so they drove the man over to the truck stop, which also housed a Sitgo gas station. In the back of the lot, the man showed them the Chrysler. When Lester was later interviewed, police asked him what he'd seen in the motel room and if there was any sign of a baby or child. Lester said there was no evidence of another person being in the room, child or adult. He described it as messy, with clothing strewn around, but not much else. They test drove the vehicle and offered $350 for it, despite the fact that you had to place two wires together to get the car started once the key was turned on. Now, I don't know where you guys are from, but where I'm from, that's called hot wiring. Lester said they went back to the man's hotel to get a receipt, and later that evening, he tried to get the Fort Wayne police to come out and inspect the vehicle, but they refused. So they drove it home, and he reported it to the Geneva police so they could verify whether it had been stolen. Lester added that the guy told them he'd gotten the car from his sister and he'd come from Michigan to sell it. When shown a picture of Marvin Gabrion, Lester positively identified him as being the man who'd sold him the car. In an interesting twist, one that illustrates how sometimes there can be little coincidences that are nothing more than that, but still have to be checked out, Lester's last name, Ebright, was the same as the relatives associated with the woman whose car Marvin had tried to sell him. None of them lived in the same state, but as you might imagine, it took police a hot minute to verify, to be sure these folks weren't all somehow related and not being upfront about what had occurred. Both the son and the ex-wife gave statements, and along with hotel records and fingerprints, the basic outline of what happened was substantiated. Police learned that Gabriel had stayed at the Value Lodge in Fort Wayne, Indiana from July 9th to the 16th. One more very interesting thing that police learned from the phone records is that Gabriel had called the local Payless Optical from the hotel room. When they checked with the store, they learned that someone had called under the name Bob Allen and made an appointment for 10 a.m. on the 21st but never showed up. Robert, or Bob Allen, was the other man who went missing from Grand Rapids and whose social security benefits Gabriel had been stealing for two years. One has to wonder what that was all about. So what other questions were they asking you when you took the polygraph? Um, they asked me if I knew if uh, John was, was alive or, or if I thought he was dead. And I, oh, I told them, I was like, you know, John and I, for the short time, we actually hung out on a regular basis. We developed a very strong bond. My instincts told me that he was alive and that he was in Phoenix, Arizona. And how he got there, I don't know. But I do know from information that I received from John prior to him disappearing was that if he went to Phoenix, no one would be able to find him. So he was planning on going missing, you think? Like, you know, going off the grid? Uh, after he disappeared, it kind of occurred to me that, yeah, he, he was actually planning it for a while. All right. So now with the hindsight of, of knowing that he was actually spotted at the lake with Marvin Gabriel in the car with Rachel... Now, what do you think about it? I didn't know he was spotted in the car with Marvin and Rachel. Yeah. He also was the person that was calling, according to Eileen, she saw him calling a Cedar Springs number on a payphone in the weeks leading up to the murder, calling someone, and she he told her it was for Lance. I know the police told me that according to phone records that they had uh, 
that they had gotten from his grandmother's phone uh, showed that he had been calling her uh, weeks prior to his disappearance. They even asked me if uh, they thought that he was capable of murder or that he would have voluntarily been a part of a, of her murder. And from what I knew of John, <laughs> about the only thing I ever knew that John would have killed would have been a bug. <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't have hurt a dog. He wouldn't have hurt a cat. You know, uh, uh, people that, that are capable of killing, I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't think that it, you know, like killing any sort of animal would be a problem. Well, tell me about his personality. Would he have been someone that would have been easily manipulated? Or if, for example, Marvin, I mean, all we know for sure as far as he went is he was down there at that campground, right, the day that she went missing. So he was down there. We don't know if he helped Marvin tie her up and put her in the water and went out there or if Marvin did it and he left on foot and got the hell out of there. But he was there up to a point. And so... The I want to know if you think if he was e maybe someone that was easy easily manipulated or was he intelligent? What what was his personality like? Um, I never saw John as a person that was easily manipulated. He if he if he wanted to do something, he was determined to do it. Um, if uh, he didn't want to participate in something, he wouldn't participate in things. So he'd stick up for himself. You think? Oh yeah. I mean, that's one thing I know that uh, caused a lot of drama between him and uh, his aunt and uncle that uh, basically took the junkyard away from him, which is why he wasn't working there anymore, was because he finally, he, in his late teens, decided, you know what, I'm not going to take any more, any more uh, garbage from them, and he stood up for himself and told them off and that that should be his junkyard, and... Yeah. So let's say, um, just for sake of argument, I don't think this is the case, but let's say he did run off to Phoenix. If there's not been any activity on his social security number or anything, um, you actually think he's the type of person that could just like get records and, and create a whole new life? Uh, that I'm not entirely sure of. Um, I mean, he claimed that, uh, his friends in Phoenix um, were capable of hiding him out and preventing him from being found. Um, and like I told the FBI and the Michigan State Police and Costa and Nuevo County and Montcalm County uh, at the polygraph, because they were all there. Really? Yeah, the FBI was there. Holy shit. I was like, listen, you know, I can find John. I said, all it would take is a round trip ticket for me to Phoenix, Arizona, and them to stay out of it until I made contact and got a hold of them. And they were like, clearly, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, they refused to send me there because uh, Aline and I would have been the only people, I think, that he would have came out of hiding for. Hmm. So that makes you wonder, did he hide because he saw what Marvin did and he was like, I'm getting the hell out of here? Or did Marvin get rid of him? Like now there's other people that Marvin are still that's still missing. You're aware of Wayne Davis, the one that was found in Twinwood, right? No. Okay, Wayne Davis was um when Marvin went to was arrested for the rape after during a t uh, period when they were doing a six month investigation. Um, Wayne was one of the witnesses, and when when he, when uh, he got served papers, Wayne's name as a witness was on it. So as soon as he got he bailed out of jail in two weeks, and right after in February of ninety seven, Wayne went missing, and he wasn't found until two thousand two, and he was found in Twinwood Lake. So it is n certainly more likely than not that John succumbed to him as well because they they believe he went missing 18 days after Rachel's uh, Rachel went missing on the 4th 18 days or so after that is what the court documents say and they believe he was a witness to the murder that he was there at the scene were were at the campground with him and at the scene at Oxford Lake so it's more likely than not that Marvin Gabriel did something to John Weeks uh 
I mean, I don't know Marvin. I never met him. I did see a picture of him in the newspaper, but uh, it was like a rest photo, so it definitely was not a very, very <laughs> good photo of him. Yeah. Um. Uh, but I mean, I'm not a big guy. I'm I'm six foot tall. I, I at the time I was about 150, 160 pounds. And John was much bigger than I was. I don't see, I never saw John as being someone easy to take out. So basically what you're saying is if Marvin did something to him, he would have had to have a gun on him or something. Yeah. To control him. My personal belief is John could have taken him. Okay. Yeah, that's something I want to know too, because obviously um, he, you're, you're going to fight for your life if, you know, and... What we know is that we know he was at the scene with Marvin. We don't know how much he knew and how much Marvin, because Marvin lied to everyone. So we don't even know if he knew that Marvin had raped Rich, Rachel beforehand. You know what I mean? That all came out afterward. John might not have even known that. But we do know that he did participate in calling her and what, whatever, whatever uh, Lance told, Lance, Marvin told him, um, he got him to do that. So he manipulated him enough to get him to, Pretend being dating this girl so that Marvin could get a hold of her because he had tried to. He was stalking her as he, when he got out of jail. And he she had called the co called nine one one twice, and she even said on the last occasion, "I'm just calling to let you guys know that he's going to kill me." And he was getting rid of all the people that knew about the rape. Um, so uh, we know that he did manipulate John at some point, but we don't know what Marvin was telling him what he was doing, and it sounds like he wasn't telling them anything because if if, if if John always talked about him well, you know, he didn't know anything bad about him. Well, from what I understood, from what uh, the cops had told me, um, was that they had talked to Allie and that Aline uh, had told them that uh, John had been contacting her because she was buying weed from Marvin. At that polygraph is when, when we had our biggest discussion, and they said that they had already talked with Aline, and that she said that the only reason why John was contacting her is because she was buying weed from Marvin. Are you saying the only reason why John was hanging out with her was because of um, because she was buying pot from Marvin? Okay, this is what was explained to me. From Aline's statement, they said that Aline had told them that Rachel would contact John, and when he wasn't home, he'd give her a call back. And that she was contacting John to get a hold of Marvin to buy weed off of him. I see. And so that's what Aline had told them. Yeah. How true that is, I don't know, because honestly, I don't really trust the cops. What what came out in the investigation eventually and what's in all the court documents is that he was pretending to ask her out on a date. What she told her dad before she left that night, she had been telling him that she'd been talking to this guy. And there are other people that she talked to and said, what do you know about this guy, John? You know, and from her perspective, from Rachel's perspective, he was trying to ask her out. And so that's what she told her and asked her on that last night, bring your kid along. I'm, well, I'll take you to dinner. So that's what she thought they were doing that night. Do you, are you thinking that what she told her dad was a lie then? What little I do know about Rachel uh, from the past um, was that I'm pretty sure her parents were against her smoking pot. All John Weeks' girlfriend knew is what she saw and what John told her. She knew John had been repeatedly calling another girl, and according to her, John told her he was doing that for Lance. Did Rachel smoke pot? Yes, that five-month stint in jail was due to a pot charge. But she hadn't been getting her pot from John prior to that. She had only just met him before she went missing. And I'm guessing the violent assault Marvin Gabriel perpetrated upon her wasn't a glowing advertisement for his future pot-selling services. But here's how we know for sure it's not true. Rachel didn't know that John knew Marvin Gabriel. We know that because John didn't know Marvin Gabriel. John knew a guy named Lance, who'd only befriended him when he moved to the area to hide out from the rape charge. Rachel didn't know John knew Marvin because John didn't know Marvin. He knew Lance. Now, maybe Rachel was trying to get pot from Lance, who she didn't know was Marvin Gabriel, 
through John Weeks. I think it's also likely that John Weeks did not know anything about the rape that had occurred in another town perpetrated by someone named Marvin Gabrion. John may not have even started connecting the dots until the news reported on a body that was found in Oxford Lake, the body of a girl that had gone missing, a girl with the same name as the girl he'd asked out on a date as a favor to his boss, Lance, a girl named Rachel Timmerman. We will probably never know for sure when John realized what he had gotten himself into, what he'd done, and his part in her death. Was he hiding out when he was sleeping under a bridge or in a barn loft or in a friend's car, or was that just the result of him not having a stable home? Had he been contemplating leaving town, heading to Arizona, and starting a new life? Did he really decide to take a trip with Lance to pick up religious books and let him drop him off in Arizona? Or had he only mentioned Arizona in passing to Lance, just like he did with Chad? And Marvin Gabriel used that information as the basis upon which he would fashion a plausible story about leaving him there, because that's the story he told police. The last sighting we have of John with Marvin Gabriel was back in early June at that campground right after Rachel went missing. Everything after that is Gabriel calling around looking for him, driving multiple times by the houses of people who knew John, clearly intent on finding him. Rachel's body hadn't been found yet when John called Chad on July 4th. Her body turned up the next day. Four days after Rachel's body was found, Lance would call Chad, someone he has never met, looking for John. According to motel records, Gabriel was already in Fort Wayne, Indiana on the 9th, where he would stay until the 16th, during which time he'd sell the hot-wired car. I suspect that John was already dead when he called Chad, and that was Marvin working on an alibi. But the muddy confluence of John's prior history in Arizona coupled with his state of homelessness at the time he went missing, culminates in a perfect storm of confusion about what really happened to John Weeks in those last days of June and in the beginning of July before he was never heard from again, at least from the perspective of reasonable doubt. I know what happened. I think we all know what happened. But no jury could convict Marvin Gabriel of John Weeks' death with the evidence we have to date. We have no body, no murder weapon, and nobody that saw or heard about John Weeks being killed. At least nobody that came forward. If you do know anything in that regard, I'd love to hear from you, and I suspect police would, too. The FBI still has an open file on both John Weeks and Robert Allen. One thing we do know is this. In prison, Marvin Gabriel would tell another inmate there were more bodies in Oxford Lake. He even drew a map, and on it was written, Body of three, one found. Are those other two bodies John Weeks and Rachel's baby? Or is that just another ruse perpetrated by a madman? Maybe John Weeks is in Too Good Lake, where Gabriel was seen ten days before John went missing. Or maybe he's in one of the other many lakes in Nuego County. There is certainly no shortage. But without any specific information about where to look, the case of John Weeks sits in a sort of purgatory. Did John do any harder drugs than pot? No. So you never saw him doing anything else? No, not when he was not when he was not when he was around here. Now he did admit to me that when he lived in Phoenix, Arizona before, that he was doing uh crystal meth and cocaine and heroin when he was there, but when he came back, he said all that stopped. And I never saw him with any harder drugs. Um, matter of fact, him and Malene and I all smoke pot together on on a regular basis. Yeah, pot never doesn't concern me because that's not going to make you into a crazy person. I'm only concerned with because I I heard that for years, um, uh, Marvin freebased coke. So um, and he was really messed up. I know around in the '80s when my other person disappeared that I'm trying to investigate, and he was in and out of state too. Because the paperwork, the police report says that Aline told them. Um, that he was going to Texas with Lance on a drug run. That's what she told the police in this report. That's what she told me afterwards. When I got a hold of her and was like, hey, um, I don't know if the cops have gotten a hold of you, but I just had a detective here talking to me. <laughs> yeah. Back in uh, whatever it was when they were investigating it. 
Because her and I were really close friends. And, I mean, over the years, for, well, pretty much ever since his John's disappearance, um, hanging out, I mean, we've bumped into each other a couple of times over the years. And we've we've never actually really hung out or talked on the phone or anything since then. But I do know from from what I from what I witnessed uh with John and Aline, um and I mean even just us hanging out at places. Um I remember one one incident. Um you know, I didn't really want to get involved and this guy and girl, uh we were just out hanging out and uh this guy and girl, they were getting into an argument. And uh, the guy looked like he was going to hit the girl. And John went over and was like, don't do it. I huh. mean, he was he was a protective person. I mean, if I was in trouble, he would have jumped in and, and saved my butt. He would have saved Aline. And he wouldn't have thought twice about it. See, that's why I'm wondering if when 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 he was seen in the car with Rachel was on the way. This was Rachel obviously was still alive because she was in the car with Marvin in between Marvin and the baby. They, nobody, the witness didn't see the baby, though. They were on the road right outside of Oxford. Like this was on their way to the lake. Um, but on the way out, another witness saw Marvin driving and he was alone. So I'm wondering if at some point during that time when John figured out what Marvin was doing, he got the hell out of there. And then Marvin tracked him down later and realized now he's a witness and I have to get rid of him because we don't know that John knew exactly what he was planning on doing with Rachel. But at some point he was there at the, and the, the problem is other witnesses saw him and, and um, Marvin together at Hungerford Lake a couple days later. He was he was spotted at Hungerford Lake a couple days later and they were trying to store their boat. They asked um, Marvin asked if he could store his boat on someone else's um, campground area because he didn't have a lot of room. And they said um, they said yes. And they, they ran across him later and saw that his campground was big and he had, a, he had plenty of room. So John was seen after the after Rachel went missing, went into the water. John was seen with Marvin. So he may have left. But Mar and then came back. He may not have known Marvin. Or may Marvin could have even sent him away. We don't know. But he was there before and he was there after. Uh, when John did call me on the fourth, I was uh, I was actually getting ready to leave. Um, typical tradition uh, for me over the years uh, was to go to uh, the Sand Lake fireworks, and I asked him, you know, hey, you know, can I can I pick you up somewhere, you know? You know, let's go to Sand Lake. And he said, you know, if he could, he'd he'd uh, he'd have his friend bring him. But he was kind of busy. See, I'm he was moving around a lot around that time, and I'm just wondering if he was trying to. Because he th here's the thing. Also, you know how Mar uh, Lance called you looking for John. He called, yep. w went by the grandmother's house looking for him. He called um, uh, Eileen's mother at work um and her aunt who they went to i mean he was calling all over the place looking for john i think john was hiding out from him and then he found him or he was do marvin was doing that to like set up an alibi like he's pretending to look for him when he's already disposed of him because he was c going crazy calling people all over the place looking for john and like i said i don't even know how he got my parents number because only my friends had my parents number so how he located their number and called me was kind of odd because yeah. I didn't know him. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't have gave him my phone number. I feel like very much like John was trying to sort of lay low. And um, now whether he did try to go out of town on his own or he was planning on it and then Marvin caught up with him, um, I don't know. But I think he was definitely trying, um, Marvin was definitely trying to track him down. Because he was the only person that would have known what happened with Rachel and could connect him to that area besides those witnesses. That's one thing that made John and I such good friends right off of the rip because we were both a little different, you know, a little a little odd, you know. And so we just didn't click with, with just anybody. Um, matter of fact, him and I were both Wiccan. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so, and I mean, Aline was too, and 
And, uh, you know, we, we did tarot card readings together. Um, we never practiced any like black magic, but, um, you know, if, uh, you know, like if I went and, you know, worked a couple of days with my parents on their dairy farm and, uh, you know, I was, my shoulders were sore or something, you know, they do healing magic on me to, to help me feel better. And, you know, John would go do a little construction project here or there, or, uh, whatever and you know he'd be like man i wrenched my shoulder today at work and you know her and i would do some healing magic on him to you know help heal him up yeah we never never used it for personal gain we did tarot card readings for each other to uh in hopes of uh (laughs) preventing anything bad from happening to any of us right so you just don't see him as like a violent type of person at all he was very calm and peaceful, and, and I mean, the only time I, I think he would get violent is if somebody was in danger. And that's what makes me think, because there were witnesses with him in the truck with um, Rachel on the way in, but on the way out of um, he, the witness that saw him, John wasn't in the car. So I'm wondering if either Lance sent him away before he wrapped her up and took her down there. You know, like when he left, he thought he, she was fine. Uh, and that makes more sense because if he saw and witnessed all that, you know, him doing something like that, it, it just doesn't make sense that he'd be back with him in a four or five days when witnesses saw him at Hungerford Lake. Yeah, so either John didn't have any clue of what what had went down because I think John would have been the type of person that would have tried to stop Marvin with the sacrifice, sacrifice of his own life. Oh, see, that makes me sad. Uh, somebody else. He was that kind of person. I'm actually kind of glad that, you know, someone's, someone's trying to look into it some more and, and, uh, you know, maybe somebody that knows something will come forward and, and, uh, he'll be found. Something nagged at me about this one part of the court testimony. Question. Mr. Gabriel, the witness, testified that on the morning of June 6, 1997, he was awoken about 4 a.m. Heard you drag a boat across the gravel take the boat into the garage, and grind something off it at the bow. Before you did that, you took three blocks and a chain out of the boat, and you later put them back and took off in your pickup truck. My simple question to you, sir, is, we know where two of the blocks are. They're government exhibits 17 and 14. Where's the third block? What did you do with it? There was no three blocks in my boat, period. No blocks? No blocks. I assume the prosecutor was trying to show that the third, unaccounted for block, was used to weigh down baby Shannon. At least that's what he wanted the jury to take from that testimony. But it's the date that gets me, and him leaving the house right after loading those three blocks into the boat. By the 6th, when he'd been seen grinding the identifying information off the boat, he had already disposed of Rachel and her baby. Rachel and John and Marvin had been seen at Oxford Lake by multiple witnesses on July 4th, two days prior, right there on the boat ramp. And there was no baby there. So where was he going on the 6th, two days later, at 4 a.m., his boat filled with more cement blocks and chains? Maybe the reason Marvin looked so mad while in the truck alone on the 4th, driving away from Oxford Lake, is because John had left sometime during the event. Maybe he realized then what Marvin intended to do, and he got his ass out of there and away from a situation he didn't want any part of. But if that's the case, I don't get why he would later meet back up with Marvin on the 6th, where they'd be seen by campers trying to get rid of the boat, He and Weeks were together there. What did Marvin do? Pick the boat up from where he'd left it at the site of the other campers after having been caught by them in a lie? Did he then take the boat home and grind off the numbers, leaving again at 4 a.m. with his boat in tow, full of cement blocks headed to wherever Weeks was? Regardless of what happened between July 4th and the wee hours of July 6th, I believe those second three cement blocks were meant for John, and that's where Marvin was headed when his neighbor heard him leave that morning. Marvin Gabrion was on his way to get rid of the last witness. The last person that could speak to what he'd done to Rachel Timmerman. The only other person that knew. In the next episode, I will explore some of Marvin Gabrion's social history and the mental health issues that have plagued his family for decades. Stay tuned.